вас попрошу э, быстрее. So please take seats. Uh, we uh, uh, have exceeded our time and we are uh, 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 getting behind our schedule. But but the presentation of his uh, presentation is so religiously important for us uh, that uh, we. Uh, uh, even our uh, recalcitrant uh, uh, restaurant agreed to move dinner to uh, uh, twelve thirty, and so. But now, just we're going just to get connected to the process and to start working hard. And I really want to repeat what I've just said. And uh, uh, we're going to have a wonderful speaker, so a great economist uh, and a practitioner and uh, a scientific researcher uh, and, and a builder uh, of uh, modern uh, uh, scientific uh, economic education. Uh, so I heard him say that uh, what uh, so the, 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 it's, it's, not, it's not because uh, of economics uh, that is its fault, but it's something in between, uh, between politics and uh, economics. Uh, it's not the, it's not, it's not, it's it's somewhere in between. It's not economics. It's not politics. It's somewhere in between, and uh, uh, this is this is where all this is happening. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, so please, I have not yet started my lecture, uh, but I already suffered. Uh, so because you're suffering, because your dinner will start half an hour later. So it's my fault. And uh, so those who have pangs of hunger. Uh, so have have the right to ask another question, additional question. So what what I wanted to talk about today. So the subject of my uh, uh, presentation. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to talk about theory and practice. I've got uh, pragmatic, practical things I'm going to touch upon. So this subject matter uh, uh, was conveyed to me by very sad events that uh, occurred in the last half a year in September 2013. Uh, so then uh, one of the greatest economists of the 20th century, uh, uh, Ronald Coles, died, mm, uh, the Nobel laureate. Uh, so there was a, uh, he, he died, uh, he died uh, at, at an old ripe age because he almost got to be 103 years old when he died. And uh, so then a few months ago, Derry Backer, uh, so then uh, the theory of human capital uh, uh, theory. Uh, disc uh, he discovered the theory, so economic uh, theory of uh, crime and punishment. Uh, so then, uh, so it's nothing. Has nothing to do with Dostoevsky. So it's quite different. Not, not that story. That's why the lecture I'm going to offer to your attention. Uh, it is dedicated to the memory of uh, those two illustrious, prominent people, uh, who, to a great extent, determined the picture of economic views and uh, for the 21st century. And uh, um, both of them uh, belong uh, to the school of, uh, imp uh, of economic imperialists. Uh, uh, so who were answering with the help of the methods, so they answered social issues, political issues. Uh, they found answers so interdisciplinary sphere. That's where they were so strong, and that's where they concentrated their research efforts. And this is the sphere uh, where uh, a lot of uh, uh, interesting things uh, occur. Uh, so the way I'm going to uh, construct this lecture, so there'll be two specific parts. So first I will talk about the economic theory, and then I'll move over to some practical things. Because what, what we mean by optimization of the state, and uh, in different states, uh, this notion, it's interpreted differently as this reduction of administrative barriers, creation of uh, a specific uh, climate, cli climate, business climate, etc. This is all polis politics. Yeah, that that is uh, uh, this is connected to the economic theory, and uh, the uh, in the economic theory of law, it's connected to it as well. And I am part uh, uh, of this policy. Just I was uh, I, I participated in the development of this policy in Russia, in Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, and uh, a little bit to a lesser extent in Ukraine. And, uh, and that's why the second part will be more pragmatic because I wanted to show you that the great ideas uh, that were born. Uh, in the second half of the 20th century, they still uh, stay and they work and they allow to make forecasts for the next 10 years. So let's start with the history of the question. So you see those two great guys. And uh, uh, but besides uh, uh, Ronald Coase and uh, Harry Becker, 
so another interesting person, uh, Richard Posner is mentioned. It's him, actually, who is, uh, who is a nominal uh, a founder of the economic lawyer, uh, law and economics. Uh, but he was a judge, uh, a member of the higher court of the United States, uh, so the most famous uh, who was involved in antitrust uh, cases, uh, considered the cases on uh, the indictment of the largest company. So the first antitrust paradox is the first case that he tried. So he explained how the how the judge, so, so in, uh, in the against the background of fighting different economic conditions and theories, he made decisions. And eventually, so he came to conclusions that allow to create uh, a law in economics, uh, law in a law, a law in economics. Uh, uh, so that's how what's what we call it in Russia a bit different. Uh, so how did it go? I will I will start with one of the main uh, 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 posits. So this is the most important theorem of uh, the 20th century. Let me explain why. And uh, so the history of this theorem is uh, is is ironic. So the, uh, it's called the theorem of Coase, although Coase never formulated the theorem. And, uh, and uh, so this was another person just who said that, who said that. So it is a Coase. So then it should have sounded this way. So, but how? Uh, so, for example, if the transactional costs are zero, then the placement of resources is efficient irrespective of the original distribution of, pro of property rights. And uh, so there's a more difficult definition uh, of the Coase uh, theorem. Theorem. So about 20, 20, 20 years, they, they quarreled how to interpret uh, this Coase theorem. And, he, and Coase watched silently. And then he said, that's exactly what I thought it would be. That's the way you, I, I thought you would interpret it. And so this illustrious guy, at the end of the day, uh, uh, is uh, not, uh, not so much the author of this theorem, but the, he's the discoverer of the fact without which it's uh, it's impossible to understand how the economic theory existed for the uh, for the previous two, 300 years. Can you imagine ph physicists uh, uh, who are convinced that all the processes occur in vacuum? Can you imagine? And it works out that they have certain models, theories, uh, uh, but they have nothing to do with real life. Because because in life we have friction, we have inertia, and the, the, the friction, and, 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 and so this is a transactional cost. This. Mm. By the way, it's, uh, those words do not belong to me. Uh, not all the smart guys have died. Some of them are still alive, and uh, perhaps at this table, too. Um, there is uh, a great uh, UK economist, uh, Mr. Arrow, who said that, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, Coase uh, discovered the friction forces in economics since uh, um, people, unfortunately, are not that uh, uh, smart and honest. I think you are all uh, adults, and uh, you uh, can guess that this is the thesis that should not be proved, although it cannot be proved. And uh, communications between people are costly. They create certain difficulties and costs, and they generate costs. And in this world, we can watch uh, the forces of social friction, which are transactional costs. Why is it important to understand the world as a whole? Uh, the best uh, human definition of the uh, Coase theorem was offered by our great friend, uh, uh, Ms. Ludmila Alexeyeva. Uh, Ludmila uh, keeps on saying that in this world, uh, everything will settle down, uh, but uh, settle down not uh, to the best effect. So uh, this is exactly uh, the uh, definition or the interpretation of the Coase uh, theorem. Because if uh, transactional costs in this world are positive, then no project uh, in a perfect case cannot be fully completed because it will be opposed by some resistance. Uh, so solutions will not be most optimal, no matter if the project was liberal, socialist, or conservative. Uh, there is always room for improvement, and uh, nothing is perfect, but uh, uh, instead there is uh, always a chance of diversity. That's the social sense of the theorem. And the theorem served the foundation for a number of new directions and scientific areas, including uh, the law and economics theory. Since uh, Richard Posner, uh, when he uh, quit as a judge and turned into a major uh, uh, 
uh, scholar. Uh, sometimes uh, it's referred to as the Posner theorem, sometimes it's referred to as Posner rule, but the idea, the rationale behind that is based on uh, the Coles uh, theorem. And it is that since uh, it's impossible or it's uh, very seldom that one can find uh, equality be uh, and equations uh, because of the frictions and uh, transactional costs, then we need to take such uh, decisions and introduce such standards and institutions that would uh, simulate uh, what the market would do if there were zero transactional costs. <coughs> so the law is required in this world be to oppose uh, the uh, uh, transactional costs. That's the conclusion ensuing from the uh, Coase theorem. Uh, so what about uh, Harry uh, Becker? He dealt with uh, human capital, and uh, uh, he uh, really uh, made uh, all officials and bureaucrats of the world quite happy because the uh, letters could not understand why they distributed the budget for uh, health care, for education. But when Harry Becker introduced the notion of uh, human capital and its growth, all officials, all uh, bureaucrats were uh, really happy because they uh, can uh, really report to legislators, to governments, saying that that's the scholars, the academic point of view, how to calculate. But some 15 years later, it uh, turned out that, that great human capital uh, models uh, didn't work. Why? Because they suggested that people uh, took decisions uh, uh, which uh, university to apply and what professions to get based on uh, their vision uh, which professions uh, would be uh, in demand in 10 years. But uh, first of all, they cannot know uh, what professions will be in demand uh, in 10 years. And it's not the young people who took the, normally the decisions, uh, their parents, uh, uh, because parents knew w which uh, professions were in demand. They, they had graduated from universities. So the real process was uh, really opposed uh, by the fact that uh, people were uh, limited in their rational thinking. And the uh, theory of human capital is very useful, but it's very naive. And it doesn't cope with a number of factors. So they didn't work. And the name of Harry Becker um, would be the synonym of great uh, uh, mistakes and arrows uh, if he hadn't uh, developed a new economic theory, the theory of uh, crime and punishment uh, that already accounted for uh, uh, those irrational behavior and uh, positive transactional costs. So I'm not going to go deeper into uh, those details. Uh, so uh, if you don't show the formula or the model, uh, you may have doubts uh, who the economist is, uh, Harry Becker and me, myself, we are both. Now let's see what uh, the uh, formula entails. There are three uh, um, conflicting conclusion, a paradoxical conclusion that uh, uh, were noticed uh, by the people who are uh, studying that. Uh, first of all, they were uh, crimi criminologists. Uh, criminologists uh, is an interdisciplinary area when uh, various people, uh, social, uh, social, uh, social, uh, social analysts, uh, uh, psychology analysts deal with uh, crime. But when economists interfered into this sphere with their method, the first statement uh, really puzzled everybody because the economists said that crime would never be defeated. Never. Because uh, uh, combating crime is a process which uh, needs costs. Uh, and those costs uh, uh, to catch uh, last uh, <coughs> criminal will be excessively high because otherwise you would not be able to uh, support an orphan G or uh, to dis develop some vaccine because you will be uh, busy uh, catching that last criminal. So in certain way, uh, a crime will stay forever. Then the very activities to combat uh, crime um, are always uh, uh, asymmetrical, since uh, power have their own um, transactional costs in uh, um, uh, combating crime. Uh, 
and I would like to speak more about this formula. And uh, I can be very brief, and uh, there is a phrase uh, which uh, you learned uh, uh, from the childhood that the severe Russian laws are addressed by the uh, by the uh, fact that they cannot be, may not be complied with. And by the way, this phrase uh, belongs to Peter Vazimsky, who lived centuries ago. I thought it was said by Saltikov Shidrin, uh, uh, but now I uh, know firmly that it was Count Vazamsky. So this formula that uh, could come up based on that phrase uh, may look in the following way. There are uh, two um, uh, cofactor, uh, the severe laws, uh, meaning the level on sanctions, uh, hardness of punishment, and uh, um, uh, low probability that those sanctions will be applied. So this uh, formula that the prosecution of crime in this sense uh, always depends on two uh, core factors uh, on how serious sanctions are and how likely those sanctions apply. And this formula overturn the uh, uh, understanding of the uh, law enforcement activities. Now let's recall a uh, great cause around uh, the discovery of friction forces. What is, uh, more, uh, what is easier for the government, for the state to say, the, uh, change the level of sanctions or to change the likelihood of catching the criminal? First, of course, uh, 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 to change the uh, severity of sanctions, you just uh, have to amend uh, regulations. And it's not about only the severity of punishment. It can also do with liberalization or humanization of, uh, uh, of the criminal codes when uh, uh, um, imprisonment uh, is replaced with uh, fines or some other fees. And those sanctions uh, can bring more revenues to the state. <coughs> Uh, death penalty is more economical than uh, imprisonment because in prison, uh, well, it's not quite clear who supports uh, uh, another's party. I don't think that the prisoner uh, makes uh, so much that uh, he can be sustained with his produce. But if a uh, criminal is killed, it's easy and uh, it's cheap. And if uh, uh, the uh, property is uh, confiscated or fine is imposed, it's also beneficial for the state. And let's think uh, what is to be done in order to enhance the likelihood of punishment of the real criminal. It's not only that uh, we need the police, investigators, uh, and agents uh, to find that uh, uh, criminal. They can find him, but the, then barristers come saying that that uh, time of the crime, that man was feeding doves uh, uh, and uh, didn't commit any crime. So the prosecution will be required to prove that the criminal is guilty. It's uh, time consuming and it's costly. But uh, this is exactly the aspect of the uh, uh, law uh, which uh, uh, stipulates the need for the uh, human rights. If there are no standards of human rights, then the activity of any states is confined uh, to the first co-factor, because we are changing the sanction and apply the, most, the cheapest uh, means, whether it is um, uh, death penalty or uh, operation conducted by the armed forces, not the police, because uh, uh, army uh, acts quite uh, more simple. Uh, some neighborhood is surrounded, running terrorists are shot at, uh, 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 all the country is busy, everybody is watching uh, and enjoying the way the, the, their safety and security are taken care of. But whether it is efficient on, and effective or not, it's another thing, and it can be done in any country if uh, uh, standards of human rights are not meaningful. And uh, as those standards are important to keep symmetry and uh, uh, to keep in balance the two cofactor. Uh, the uh, strongness of punishment and likelihood of punishment. So and the first bullet on the slide uh, brings about quite a paradoxical conclusion again. And uh, it's like the uh, Columbus egg uh, when you say something and everybody not saying, yes, it's true. But before uh, uh, the Columbus, uh, Columbus uh, put uh, uh, that egg at, at top, nobody knew how to do that. Uh, criminologists uh, for many years were bothered with the problem that, say, some new measures uh, were introduced to combat crime, but uh, without any uh, success. And then uh, no measures are introduced, but uh, all out of a sudden, 
crime is on the downturn. Why? Reasons are known. Because uh, for many years, uh, uh, scientists of various professions uh, trying to figure out that uh, some sentences and uh, uh, legislations are amended, uh, the criminal world uh, convenes uh, in a seminar. That's about Professor Mariotti, for instance, uh, a foreign agent and criminal world are two different things. OK, so there is some ideal. Professor Moriarty who holds a seminar and makes an analysis. But in reality, it happens a different way. Nobody convenes any seminars. But uh, when uh, uh, criminals uh, are released from prison, they say that, you know, everything is anew. Everything is changed, uh, is told uh, when they have uh, meetings uh, in their prisons. And it's because not the, it, it's not the Professor Maria Mariotti who conducts uh, criminal utilities and the criminals are also rational people so uh, they are also adjusted to the measures so uh, the question is uh, how various punishments work because uh, punishment uh, performs various functions uh, retaliation is one thing uh, uh, eye for eye for instance and uh, rehabilitation and Dostoevsky used to say that uh, we don't understand uh, why a criminal can be corrected if he is put uh, in one place together with other criminals and make them do some senseless things. But in general, the idea that rehabilitation may come is there. Uh, criminals can be isolated, just taken away from uh, the society, or uh, there can be some containment. Uh, and that's uh, the most serious thing, how punishment impacts uh, those uh, who are outside the system who are, also, uh, are only going to commit a crime. Again, uh, I'm not going to speak about that for long, but economists gave uh, all the answers when they began uh, drawing uh, graphs. And uh, it so happened that there are some uh, crimes uh, which, uh, speaking uh, economic uh, language, are not uh, uh, price uh, elastic. For instance, there is a maniac who kills people or a drug addict uh, gets money for drugs. You can introduce any uh, levels of punishments, but uh, they will not impact uh, the behavior of those criminals, since uh, in this sense, uh, we are not dealing with limited rationality. We are dealing with irrational behavior. <coughs> so. The uh, punishment measures uh, can be different. Uh, it's isolation. If you isolated a, a maniac, then certainly you can achieve something. But uh, uh, have you achieved containment? No, because uh, maniac successor will do the same as his predecessor. And speaking of containment, perhaps uh, we uh, reach uh, the most uh, important inter-civilizational problem of today, and so that's the problem of death penalty. Looks like the most effective way to contain uh, crime is uh, to threaten criminals with death penalties. And uh, certainly, uh, uh, it's uh, uh, the man who is executed uh, uh, cannot be stopped because he is executed. But th this example can stop uh, and contain other criminals from committing those uh, uh, capital crimes. And the economists. Uh, began uh, building various uh, uh, models. Uh, uh, Isaac Alex is one of the most popular of them, and it's based in, on the American law uh, that uh, uh, each uh, death penalty saves the lives of 15 people. Uh, uh, Europe was shocked with that. Asia got surprised, and some additional research started. I'd like to say that by today, in uh, science, it's a European uh, opinion that uh, has triumphed, uh, saying that death penalty is not efficient and effective. This graph shows the uh, level of criminal activities in two uh, countries. Donahue Zibring did that, and it's based on uh, Hong Kong and Singapore uh, statistics. In one of the uh, states, uh, death penalty uh, and execution were expanded. In, uh, in the other, uh, it was abolished. And it was in the same period of time, 1993, 1994. Look at the graph. Uh, if you see the difference, please tell me what the difference is. Uh, so it means that uh, uh, the death penalty availability or uh, non-availability do not impact uh, uh, crime rate at all. 
And why was Europe convinced in the first place and that the main uh, uh, difference between Europe and uh, America in that? Why did America start looking for uh, those uh, um, um, facts uh, in the first place? You know, uh, throughout its uh, political history, America lived uh, uh, under the conditions of democratic power without any attempts of coup d'etat and no terrorist regimes uh, were established there. While in Europe and in Asia, uh, they saw some, and they know that uh, that not only people but judges can uh, make mistakes, legislators can commit mistakes. So. Uh, uh, people are uh, rationally limited, and uh, there is another unpleasant fact that uh, that's not, not only uh, not God, but they're not angels at all, and uh, uh, probably people, not all the people are prepared to behave in good faith. Uh, they can pursue their own mean interests. So, um, uh, because of the fact that legislators are also limited rationally, it means that no legislative system and their enforcement uh, are in existence that would uh, um, punish uh, the guilty and release the uh, innocent uh, with 100% guarantee. And uh, there are some cases when innocent can also be punished just for the sake of punishing the guilty. Or uh, uh, if you relieve your pressure, then it may so happen that uh, the innocent are not punished, but uh, those who are guilty infiltrated through the uh, net of laws and uh, escaped the punishment. So the law and economics theory says that you never built a perfect uh, uh, system, or similarly like you never built a perfect socialist system, uh, perfect market economy. It's uh, next to I it's impossible because transactional costs are always positive. There is always room for improvement. So you can uh, make either uh, one mistake or uh, the other. But it's not that bad But uh, uh, the, the, that such a mistake uh, could lead to a death penalty. OK, so if innocent is imprisoned, uh, mm -hmm. that person can be released and then compensated. Uh, but uh, if uh, the person is dead, when you realize the person was executed without any guilt. You cannot help it. So even the probability of the judicial uh, mistake is enough argument so that uh, the OLEC model cannot work. And judiciary and uh, prosecution investigators uh, can act on even different motives, not because they do not understand or do not see something. Uh, there is a famous story which is uh, now getting forgotten, but uh, in the last decade of the USSR, there was the famous case of whom? Do you know what I mean? Yes, uh, Yelly Safe uh, uh, supermarket food uh, uh, store. Uh, its director was uh, sentenced to death, uh, but he started uh, uh, giving evidence uh, to criminal uh, connections uh, on top. Uh, and suddenly, uh, a secretary general died, and a new secretary came to power, and the sentence uh, was executed uh, uh, on the same night. Why? They uh, did so. They realized that it had to be done exactly uh, on that day, because if there is no man, there is no problem. It's all done. It's all gone. So uh, in, as a result, uh, there are some conclusions uh, that are related not only to death uh, penalty, but they uh, relate to the uh, law system as a whole. Economists, irrespective of their origin, believe that the uh, Anglo-Saxon system of law is better, is more beneficial for economics and social activity. Why? The reason is very simple. If we understand that legislators cannot predict all the situations happening in the world, then his law, their laws uh, will also uh, um, be erroneous in the first or second uh, sense. If uh, we understand, then the, the last uh, deliberate constructs are there, the last uh, errors are made, 
and standards are required in uh, those situations and conflicts arise, we say that uh, uh, it's uh, the systems where people regulate their s the relations themselves, they sh the, those systems are better. And when there is a conflict between people, the uh, judiciary takes a standard which becomes the norm of law. I would say that lawyers have a different opinion. Um, and there is a famous Russian lawyer who used to uh, tell me, I fully agree uh, with the fact that the case law system would be better. But I ask you, never uh, mention my name in this connection. And uh, that's what I'm doing. Because uh, you can understand that uh, a sentence to a certain uh, law system means that uh, the entire uh, legal corporation uh, uh, will lose their jobs and the gigantic change in the system. So not all the recommendations of economists can be implemented. Nevertheless, in order to complete the theoretical part and switch to practical things, let's try to think of some interim conclusions so that not to miss anything. And uh, overall, there are three conclusions that uh, I would like you uh, to take attention of so that we could move on uh, uh, and explore an uh, uh, entirely different area. So um, the first conclusion is that the transactional costs are always positive. So automatically, uh, equilibrium in the market is not uh, achievable. But uh, that's precisely why we need some legal and law standards. Uh, um, but the producers of uh, law institutions uh, 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 runners uh, with uh, limited rationality can make uh, the uh, mistakes and errors of the first or the uh, uh, second uh, level. And the state uh, is not only trying to make up for the lack of automatic equilibrium, but in its place is the source of uh, transactional costs and needs streamlining or optimization. Like a market, it's not virtue. It's not perfect project. No, uh, neither market, no state are perfect projects. And this optimization uh, is uh, uh, the third uh, said by sober conclusion, uh, meaning that optimization, and uh, this optimization is not possible um, to be based on some perfect uh, plan, because otherwise uh, in our f uh, third stage we would do the same sin. Uh, there is no uh, perfectness. N nothing can be perfect. Uh, and uh, various strategies may lead to the optimization of the state. And that's exactly the subject of our next part. Let's switch to the practice immediately, trying to see how different countries, countries that are not uh, distant from each other, resolve the issue of optimization of their states. And that is a uh, 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 reduction of transactional costs in economic language. In political uh, language, it's called uh, uh, administrative uh, barriers. And in the language of indices, it's the uh, indice of uh, uh, doing business or business climate. That uh, uh, graph shows how uh, Ukraine, Belarus, Russia, and Georgia uh, made their progress. The lower uh, the curve is, the better result is since uh, we are talking about the uh, reduction of uh, transactional costs, uh, lowering administrative barriers, and uh, very sad results um, uh, showed Ukraine. Uh, we might have guessed that in the first place, and that uh, Ukraine uh, has accumulated a great burden of problems uh, so that it burst out the way it did. Russia uh, is doing better than Ukraine, but not that good. Uh, performance of uh, Kazakhstan uh, are much better. Belarus uh, uh, curve uh, is like that. They first followed Russia's track, and then they switched to Kazakhstan track. Uh, Belarus leaders uh, revised their optimization strategy. And I think uh, uh, it's Georgia who achieved most radical result. And since uh, uh, it's a, a 
mostly about the years of Saakashvili's reforms, so that those results uh, were achieved at that time. So let's talk about the uh, alternative strategies results. And, uh, uh, you know, th those are results uh, that really show and uh, what is uh, beyond uh, 2013 and beyond 2014. Now there is a great dispute uh, ongoing about the uh, growth rate uh, of Russia's economy since it's most likely that this year we have zero. The Ministry of Economy believes it will be 0.5%, uh, but that's within the limits of just the statistic arrow. If nothing bad happens, uh, which can always happen, then it will be zero. But uh, uh, the desired result is not zero. And it's not that, uh, it's not only that zero is bad as uh, the title, but uh, in the countries uh, with uh, an accumulated burden of problems uh, um, related to infrastructure or there is a great gap between the rich and the poor, some high uh, growth rates are to be maintained. Well, uh, China is normally praised, uh, but uh, should China drop its uh, uh, growth annual growth rate uh, lower than 6%, China will die they cannot uh, uh, develop at a slow rate because uh, there are disbalances and disorders and uh, discrepancies. So uh, we can all, uh, cannot all uh, uh, allow 3 or 1 or 2 percent as uh, Germany can. No less than 4 percent per year because of the social rifts, uh, the, uh, the uh, low strata of the society already feel the situation worsening. So indeed, if uh, the growth development is under 4%, uh, that is already felt. Um, if uh, I were to be asked uh, by the Prime Minister uh, to grow uh, uh, the economy by 12% in 2015, we can do that. But do not then ask us what is going to happen to the country in 2016 and 2017. So let us try and consider this, um, and I will analyze this deriving from the experience which was general for, for all, for, for all of us, uh, because um, the, the, p the politics uh, on uh, the decrease of uh, transaction costs was uh, de-bureaucratization or the reduction of uh, bureaucracy. I am partially responsible for this politics because in the year 2000, in the framework of the so-called GREFS uh, program, when uh, when uh, Mr. Putin was in his first term uh, in office, and uh, he was, by the way, the first to use uh, the uh, decrease of bureaucracy term or de-bureaucratization term. Uh, indeed, the president, uh, so at that time, history, we were doing this uh, with Vladimir Mao. We were, we were indeed uh, uh, in the vanguard uh, of this uh, process. We were talking about the administrative barriers. And uh, I always uh, say there's one historian uh, who might have uh, talked before you, which is uh, Alexander Daniel. He, he says that whenever uh, the same event in Russia can be um, uh, can be uh, uh, explained by conspiracy or the mess up, uh, I definitely say that it's uh, the mess up and not a conspiracy. Um, of course, people are not angels, uh, and we know that for sure. But uh, this reduction of bureaucracy uh, was such that the there were conditions of creation of new systems when uh, with the zero import tariff um, under uh, the Gaidar's government, a huge import started, and with the zero experience of the consumers, certification of nearly 80% of all goods was introduced, which was technically impossible. <coughs> and when it turned out that some of these barriers don't work, then uh, the uh, so-called uh, these uh, barriers uh, were were finished. And so our task with Vladimir now, where Mao was as follows. 
Those who tried uh, to decrease these barriers, um, of course, at the assignment of the government, uh, caused uh, uh, caused the, uh, the the reaction, and indeed the barriers uh, started to grow even higher. Every time that this state uh, starts to struggle with bureaucracy, I know for a fact that the bureaucracy will grow in numbers. I can't say that this is bad or good, because uh, I always say that why do you believe that many bureaucrats is too bad? Uh, uh, we also have uh, many people uh, working for the food industry, but they produce something. And I said, well, fine. So it is not about the number of officials, but but what is uh, actually the number of the bureaucrats uh, which produce something. So our task was to not to r not to reproduce the effect of a, uh, of a carcinogenic uh, tumor, which uh, grows only because it has been touched. And so when uh, the first uh, laws on uh, de-bureaucratization were adopted uh, with great stress um, and uh, great pressure from the president. And when the monitoring of the World Bank started, this monitoring was uh, conducted by uh, Sergei Gordiev, who was a not well-known uh, economist. He called us after the first round and said there is no effect. I said, uh, Sergei, only a law may say that the effect of the law uh, is introduced on the day of its, of its effect. When is the next round? I will wait. In six months, the costs uh, went down by, by 20 to 30 percent, the transaction costs. So uh, this politics uh, led uh, to some uh, success, and many countries, unfortunately, we don't have a graph before in the first half of uh, of uh, of this first 10 years of this century but it turned out that these effects were not uh, particularly long standing i will cite one example we uh, were able to remove some of the sanitary inspection barriers. But with that said, we would not have been able to take this through the parliament without, uh, without uh, persuading the other groups that we're uh, not uh, going uh, to assault, uh, uh, say, the controlling bodies. And it turned out that uh, new forms of uh, pressure um, uh, on the business uh, emerged. So I have to say, as a as a uh, doctor of uh, of economy, um, uh, the the recipe that we have uh, um, prescribed to the Russian economy uh, were definitely efficient, but that this action was limited, and that a new generation of medications had to be developed, and we did that. But I did not do it in Russia. I did it in Kazakhstan, because. The then presidential chief of staff of, uh, of, the, of Kazakhstan asked me uh, the qu a question. Could you uh, indeed uh, try and uh, work out the new generation? But that's an interesting thing. Uh, but because we are not, uh, thanks be to God, uh, um, uh, developing not armaments but uh, economic uh, models. We will. We tried uh, this uh, new generation, and we call this uh, positive reintegration because when people say that uh, the society, the government, and the business have to interact, uh, they have long been integrated. When the business pays bribes uh, to the government, and the government uh, gets a share in the business, uh, and the consumers uh, are trying to uh, make uh, a buck uh, on. Uh, the uh, consumer protection law. What is this? This is this is integration, but the bones have uh, have been ill matched. So we have to be talking about reintegration that could uh, produce uh, positive results. We have uh, uh, and the Kazakhstani government uh, 
did apply our recipes, and you see this uh, blue line on the graph. This is the the reflection of this effect. Why was it efficient? To the five principles. First, it is the principle of the third. You should never forget about the consumer. Just as many as uh, consumers' policy should not uh, um, uh, be, obliv have a, uh, be oblivious of the business. Secondly, you have to understand that there can always be different competing um, competing uh, models and the same task uh, can be resolved uh, through say coercion or, or cooperation and and these models always compete and you have to take into account that you have to have space for such uh, solutions and there is it is never possible that if a business is strategically find something st to be strategically useful it will not do it why Business uh, is uh, is preoccupied with its success. So when the technical standing order needs to be developed, who comes and picks it up? Those who have uh, uh, who have who are facing the danger of being kicked out from the market. What do they have to do not to be kicked out of the market? They have uh, to to. Uh, um, change uh, uh, the uh, uh, the conditions, and they need to cover the costs. So your costs will be covered in in one way or another. And I have to tell you how how the Kazakhs did it. They introduced a mandatory membership in the Chamber of Commerce. A mandatory membership with a nominal membership fee and a large uh, uh, fee for the big business. That's one of the ways uh, to solve this. Mandatory uh, mandatory um, membership within uh, the... Um, what I was most criticized of, especially in Russia, uh, that was the principle of reasonable compensation. I said that, uh, that there are always influential groups of bureaucracy which are against reforms and that need to be taken into account and that reforms need to be bought from them. How? You, 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 what do you mean? So you are uh, proposing uh, to buy them out. Well, and I would ask, uh, well, what do you want? Uh, do you want uh, to make the reformers minesweepers? Because, yes, in our countries, bureaucracy has real uh, influence, yes. It needs to be said that this bureaucracy has its uh, interest. And if uh, these interests are not introduced, if um, the balance has not been struck, then uh, um, you don't, uh, you, your value is, is, is zero. You will confine uh, to just beautiful plans and nothing will come out of this. Who will, uh, who will, be, propose, who will be propagating this, uh, these plans? Uh, and I will try to quote uh, what do I mean by compensation, having told you about a successful case of such compensation. This not, need not necessarily be, uh, be uh, uh, monetary compensation. This can be compensation in kind, or um, the head uh, of uh, the, uh, um, Mr. Boris Alyoshin, uh, the head of the Committee for Economic um, Reforms, I was asked to be an arbiter uh, in licensing of the cartographic uh, um, activities. And I said to myself, I do not understand anything about this. You will understand. I was told representatives of the Federal uh, Bureau of, uh, of uh, Security, uh, the FSB, and others were there. And the problem was that the GPS navigation had to be permitted in some way. 
For that, licensing of cartographic activity had to be abolished. So the ban on, uh, on uh, the actual maps are to be available to people. Because without that, uh, uh, neither GLONASS nor GPS uh, uh, would have been possible. Uh, I was uh, asked on behalf of the government uh, to, to deal with this. And I said, well, uh, please uh, tell me what is the problem? Why are you uh, for the abolishing, but as an agency you're against this? Well, there are people working there. There are special people who are uh, responsible for the fact that these officers, uh, generals, and so on and so forth, uh, all right, I understand, how, how, how long uh, do the generals have, uh, have to serve? For about two to three years. All right, I said, uh, and is there enough time for them to requalify? Yes. Let us agree that in three years uh, we, can, uh, we can get uh, uh, the abolish uh, the uh, licensing of cartographic activities. On radio, I hear in three years that uh, cartographic uh, activities uh, uh, are now permitted. So it was a compensation deal. And such compensation deals and, uh, and, uh, and compromises need to be uh, made. Uh, such concessions have to be made. Uh, the fact that the laws don't uh, actually start to function, not from the day of of entering into force, but the mechanisms of implementation are required, uh, was well understood um, at, every, at every turn of our politics, uh, because at that time, we worked with uh, um, Andrei Barazbash, uh, a series of cartoons uh, that uh, had to support a de-bureaucratization over 10 years ago. You don't remember that. It's all right. And that was, uh, and when German Griff, uh, the Minister of Economy, said, uh, "All right, let's let us remove these uh, cartoons." Uh, there was nothing insulting about, uh, of, you know, but uh, the system uh, had been criticized. Uh, and the system of control father and son are playing a game this was this is the plot of one of these car cartoons i'm a state and i'm the legal entity no father said no let's play gestapo this was this was this was the kind of cartoons that we had and no, 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 no. I didn't compose this. Uh, Andre Rasbash did that with the students. Uh, they, they, they were so, they were very, very inexpensive to produce. By the way, uh, this was like an awareness raising campaign uh, that was uh, to so be associated with our, uh, with our programs. So German Griev, when he said that uh, the TV channels uh, uh, didn't want to, didn't want to uh, turn them down. This was the strategy in general. But there was a time when. Uh, there were other versions available. Let us look at this uh, slide, which uh, shows the situation by 2011. Three alternatives. Uh, alternative number one, while we were uh, conducting the, what we called this positive reintegration in Kazakhstan, I had to talk uh, before the economic bloc of the government, and I was saying that as an economist, I am uh, very, very um, uh, glad that the neighboring state is implementing my programs, but as a citizen, I am uh, uh, deeply uh, chagrined uh, by the fact that Russia doesn't uh, take use of this. And I said that, uh, of course, I would have uh, um, uh, loved my country to, to 
move along uh, uh, the more positive curve. Whereas uh, Georgia uh, borrowed uh, the, those ideas which were proposed uh, uh, around the year 2000 and, uh, and indeed um, and, and uh, we can see this uh, from Kazakhstan. Yes. Kairat Kilimbetov, uh, the head of the Central Bank of Kazakhstan. He said, uh, we're, we're, we're um, a lot uh, more, c we're a lot cooler. We're cool. They might be listening uh, to to our broadcast. Oh, that's good. That's excellent. Well, Elena Nemirovska, people speak because they want to be heard. Yes, we have a broadcast. That's right. The Georgian um, uh, option. Indeed, Kaha Bendukidze dealt with this, and we were working on this, uh, on these um, issues together with him. And then he stopped from being uh, a Russian uh, businessman and uh, was uh, turned into a Georgian Minister for Economic Development who said when he was leaving for Georgia, because the Georgian economy is dead, any, uh, the, even the boldest experiments are possible. And as you can see, there has been there have been some results um, achieved. Well, I have not finished my lecture yet. No, I can finish my lecture in three minutes. No problem. All right. Should I finish in three minutes? No. All right. So let us try and analyze. For us to understand, or try to understand what will happen after the uh, year two f two 2014, we have to try and understand what is the basis of, of every system. In Russia, the most important uh, um, task uh, was uh, to uh, to optimize the procedures. In Georgia, uh, there was uh, an objective of creating uh, more of a laissez-faire state to minimize the role of the state. And I can't uh, say if it's uh, if it's uh, if I agree entirely with this. In Kazakhstan, the the target was uh, to raise uh, what we may call the adequacy of the state uh, for it to be more compatible to what uh, the demands of the society are. In the Russian option, uh, the presumption was that the business is uh, dishonest and the bureaucracy are honest. In Georgia, the presumption was uh, that the business is honest and the bureaucrats are dishonest. And I think that both assumptions are unrealistic. As Cardinal Mazarini said, that all men uh, have to be considered to be honest, but they all have to be dealt with as fraud. So the Kazakhstan um, was uh, coming uh, out uh, from uh, 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 a not very pleasant presumption that uh, both business and bureaucracy can be dishonest. So to uh, answer your unasked question, but that the question that I might predict, uh, that uh, the Kazakhstani option will be stable but the Georgian will not be stable because it derives from unrealistic presumptions. What will happen to the Georgian uh, program? Uh, we will see the same uh, fate as, uh, as uh, took over our experiment. This was an intermediate drug, a placebo. Uh, the effect was short-lived because the presumptions, as I said, were unrealistic. And every of these has its uh, pros and cons. This slide 
shows us uh, we, we have shown this uh, to the government of Russia. In 2011, I was the head uh, of uh, the Commission for Optimization of the State Procedures within the 2020 Commission. This was very interesting work. Participated by over 1,000 Russian economists. We were told at the beginning of 2011, what did you want? You wanted these programs to be author-based. You wanted these uh, developments to be to have alternatives. Is that right? Yes, we said. All right, we agree. It was not possible to to. There were two economists who turned down the proposal. But the only way when you turn down such a proposal is that I will not sit by the table with these people. And I think that this is one of the major problems of Russia. Uh, I indeed uh, very glad that Russia has a coat of arms uh, and has a, f a flag uh, and has an anthem, uh, but it doesn't have a creed. If it had had the creed, it would have say that I will not sit by, with, by, by, by one table with these people. People have to communicate. People have to talk. Without that, there is no national court. And uh, the slide that you see here is one of the slides which was shown uh, to the Russian government. And these strategies uh, have their advantages or disadvantages. Um, we uh, were asked a question by the government uh, to to we were asked what do we have to do what do we have to sacrifice or what do we have to perform to enter one or another strategy in a w in a w in one week after this uh, meeting at the government offices uh, we made uh, this slide um, and uh, showed that it is not easy to enter one of these strategic pools but uh, some strategies are easier to embark on than others. Well, this strategy uh, is good by its initial premises, but not particularly material. But it is very soft. The Georgian variant of uh, or option of uh, um, debureaucratization or the radical debure, it is a political, uh, um, it is based on a political will. It requires a reconsidering of, of, of very important laws. And this is what uh, what uh, President Putin had to do when he spoke uh, to Mr. Kasyanov, who was the head of the government. He said, either this government uh, will uphold uh, these laws or, or uh, another government will do that. And these were very conflicting uh, decisions. And uh, with respect uh, to, to political uh, work um, and, and, and the uh, option in Kazakhstan, let me quote uh, uh, the so-called uh, selective uh, distribution of the fiscal uh, revenues, the tax revenues. Let me quote an example which is, uh, seems to be well known. Crimea and uh, uh, Sevastopol have never been in the budget of Russia in terms of the costs. So for this to happen, 
uh, the monies uh, have to be derived uh, from from somewhere. Uh, the bridges in uh, across the Lena River uh, have to be uh, abolished as uh, projects, uh, and uh, uh, the port in Novorossiysk uh, had uh, to be uh, had to be abolished. Uh, but as long as there is a, a consolidated position of the people. Uh, and uh, there is an urgent need for financing of major mega infrastructure projects then uh, uh, then uh, then say uh, the, the a solidarity tax was introduced for instance in Germany uh, we proposed uh, to the um, to the Russian government uh, to introduce uh, the solidarity tax and the Russian government declined this offer why should we not do that? Uh, because half of the population would not back it, and two-thirds of those who would back it would not pay it. <laughs> and indeed, so you can't confine yourself to just say, say, say to saying that. Uh, oh, I like that, or you know, I like I like this particular. Because <laughs> there are no other other mm, options or other venues. Um, let's see. I predict uh, that from January the 1st of 2015, there will be uh, a, sif a significant change in, uh, in the uh, real estate uh, property uh, tax, which uh, is uh, partially due to uh, a sharp decrease in the profit tax collection and the general uh, and this, uh, the country is sinking into recession, which uh, which cannot help uh, influencing the budgets of the regions. Property tax is a high property tax, according to the uh, its cost, its price, according to Daisters, not real estate registry. But I have been saying all the while, let people vote with the rubles for this or other decision. Uh, whether you spend it on infrastructure housing, it's like um, savings pension. At that, Ministry of Finance are happy about this. They say, let people vote with their ruble because when money sort of, when you think about how you're about to spend the money, then there's another sort of closer link between the state and its citizens. So far, we haven't done it. Actually, I'm pleased that we insisted upon other things. Let's see how it remains to be done. Given that under the uh, official slower economic growth, investment in, the, in, in human capital will not go down. Why? Because my idea was, and I'm very thankful to economists who supported it, under slowing growth in recession, any government, actually speaking, looking for a good multiplier. That means such expense that it looked like very much like in 2009, 2008, to hand out the money to the population, when uh, to the public, when they raised the pensions. Politically, it was very good. Economically, sort of leveled off the nasty impact of reform. We could also invest into a defense um, industry. It's a good multiplier, at least in, in part. The hysteric that is going on in the country because of the geopolitical question has very good economic economic explanation. Remember, 1914, nobody wanted a war, and then look, bam, bam. Um, when in three months they killed two million people, they just, it was too late. It was too late to go down by the sort of heated up economy. There was no word that they knew at the time, multiply, but this is what happened. What about human capital? In a decade, it wouldn't give you a positive multiplier. In 10 years, it will, yes, later return with a positive. But nobody would want to invest in it. And as we leave the crisis sometime in the 2020s, uh, 2015, competitive advantage of the countries will be determined solely by whether they can produce high quality human capital or not. 
This is why I insisted when we have fewer and fewer revenue, less and less revenue, investment into human capital should not go down. This is where the Premier um, agreed with me. So as usual, the score is one to one. With your permission, I would make my conclusions about these strategies of optimization of the state, and then we'll move to the Q&A session. Yes, indeed, we should take into consideration transaction costs because of opportunistic behavior and possible mistakes or malapfide actions. Yes, a strategy that in part or unilaterally takes it into consideration is not stable, even if it produces good results. Yes, indeed. It's hard to move from one policy to another course. It always has to do with high cost and major decisions that have to be taken. It always uh, affects the interests of um, some party or another. Anyway, it's always a political decision about which strategy we're about to adopt. Yes, you're right. You can never get a perfect solution that will suit everybody. The competition between the strategies will go on. And every way, every strategy that will enhance the solutions, if it is finding good new solutions, that's why economic theory of law goes a theorem, economic theory of crime and punishment, all these things that are really elevated, very broad, but very much applicable. This is about our life today. What you need to do, you need to do how this works, how this can be applied. And then not can you only design sort of your policy, but also predict what will happen in certain countries, certainly with a certain degree of probability. Thank you. Thank you. Q and A. Dear colleagues, we now open the Q&A session. Milady, please remember to give your name. Natalia Mikheva from Moscow. My question is about human capital. I have prepared it for you. Dear Alexander Alexandrovich, thank you for your presentation. My question. From the State Duma, deputies now said fears that access of our citizens to foreign online courses, for example, Khan Academy TED will lead to young people who will get a certificate from global universities and will find it easier to leave Russia because they will get a job abroad. Therefore, a discussion like uh, not to allow or say these courses are in English and our people do not have good command of English and doesn't matter. Nowadays, volunteers, several hundred, maybe several thousand, uh, translate Coursera. So the question is what the Moscow State University or maybe your department and maybe the university community is going to take about this? And for example, why is it in Coursera, just for comparison, a con conventional course is 2,000 rubles and you cannot even you know, buy it out later on. But I've looked at um, MSU site is worth 6,000 rubles and I mean just remote learning course and tourism 25,000. In our case in Russia, you have to personally report to, to, to be ex for an exam, whereas in Coursera, it's all remote. And it's interesting that to be enlisted in remote course, you must send a copy of your passport and other documents. Such a difficult question. First of all, may I point out that we looked very carefully. There's a special program for that matter Meanwhile, тем временем, uh, special that Alexander Arhangelsky produced about this course, online courses. You can look it up in the archive of the issues. I would like to make this very strange statement that MSU, Moscow State University, doesn't see a major threat in the fact that global universities now disseminate this systems because so far in global practice certificates yes are interesting but nobody has yet received a diploma or a degree and I claim that nobody would ever do because in order to fight for diplomas this is where we compete for students remote and distance learning courses are rather a marketing tool 
Although I should admit that what they do is Moscow State University does this. I suppose Moscow State University has truly become a university on the 13th of April in 2013. This is my big day because this is when we started to deliver special courses where, which be attended by students from many departments. Every student has to attend at least four courses, sign up for courses in other departments or anything between four to 12 or even 16, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, let, let it be 12, just for argument's sake. And they are diverse courses. I was very happy when my students from my department, I can see what they uh, sign up for. Well, we were the leader. We have 2.5 thousand students who attend our department and 2.5 thousand from other 40 departments or faculties, what we call, where our students, uh, they were very popular courses, for example, origin of the mind and the biological biology department, or mathematical models in, um, this is Deputy Constructor General, uh, Designer General of the Russian Federation, the role of Shakespeare in global culture, history of Russia's history of theater. This is great. So nowadays we're making up like we used like 10 years ago, Stanford University began to adjust the basis for its global influence. But we began to do it because on the, they wanted us, we just asked us, can students from other universities, can they sign up for these courses? We said, no, they can't. Indeed, they can't. This is according to the law, because this is where we spend budget money and we have no right to teach those who don't pay for education or have not been admitted to a university which does not mean that they cannot look up online the courses that we filmed and that we post on the web. Why not? That's why we certainly are lagging behind here. I think that this has to do more with marketing. I think that communication between the teacher and the student still, in part, should be, you know, uh, personal, eye to eye because there are what we call high context and low context culture. These courses are a great success in what we call low context culture, where a written text and what is going on are very close. I can say that for France, Germany and France and Russia is not the case because um, many things are just told in person and not in the um, whatever the textbook says. This is a special feature of our culture. So I'm giving this sophisticated answer to your question. I have no danger whatsoever about people going to online courses because it's dangerous. I would say it's dangerous for those people. You don't know what kind of training or what kind of job they will find, how much it really corresponds to what they learned online. But even within Russia, I'm against they tell us, oh, we have too many universities. 88% of our school students go to universities. I don't think there is anything bad about it. 90% of uh, d uh, residents of South Korea go to universities. It's great. But we should understand that most universities are useful for this reason, because they um, produce middle class. They produce people who understand that they shouldn't drink cheap alcohol. The deposits are different, and fitness is just around the corner. It's very good for the country and its economy. That's why I'm all, all in for gaining access to online courses in Russian, English, Chinese, Japanese. But what follows is later, it's good for personal development, but for professional training and affiliation, I suppose you have to graduate um, very much, not an online course, but very much um, university. I wanted to ask this question without giving my name. Why is it that you, Lena Nimirovska, okay, Moscow School of Civic Enlightenment, you're quite right. And graduate, can we call you, you're a graduate, Lena? Can we say you're a graduate? Yes, I'm graduate of every year. Do you have a diploma? Do you own a diploma, Lena? Well, you don't. Well, well, I should say that I'm a graduate of all uh, years, and I think that I'm at least people of my generation and myself, it seems to me understand a thing or two about my generation. My and then my question is, 
Since I also think that that the profession and something else, this add-on thing, this is what makes a modern person, and this civic sort of add-on, uh, what we are speaking about. I wanted to tell you, since this is such a severe, uh, repressive, punitive idea about such organizations like us, what, why are we there? What are we needed for? In all this education structure, well, Liana, first of all, I'm surprised that you think that you are a graduate of the schools, because I keep telling, I, I, I've never learned economy, economics. I just teach people, because in my day, there was, I never actually passed any exams. I've just read some books, and now I think I can teach. For that matter, it's not, it's a shortcoming, because we haven't graduated from any academies or universities. That is the old Soviet joke. But I would put it this way. In my view, in principle, the system of education is needed for three things. First, and this is what everybody understands, well, growing human capital, professional competencies that could be used by in more competencies, greater salary, greater sales, greater compensation. Everybody understands that. However, there is another second product of this kind of system. This is what a nation should get a certain set of diverse professions and people. For that matter, it was perfectly understood by Napoleon Bonaparte. Although Adam Smith, although he didn't use this name, but he spoke that universities, we shouldn't give them any money, let the students pay for getting education from professors, and then in the market they will get the money back, because their skills would sell. This is when Napoleon Bonaparte thought that the state should give money to the university, but he shouldn't give any money for research and science, because it's some unknown matter. Uh, this is some... And uh, this is, but and there is a third product. Education uh, is reproducing the culture of a nation. This is a certain set of values and attitudes, understanding what is good, what is bad. On the 22nd of June, I will be in ProScience Theater, will be delivering a lecture about cultural codes of economy, how this or other set of values can determine specialization, uh, what can the country can do and the country cannot do, the rate of its growth in movement, and who is doing it all. This is done by educational systems. So what to a greater degree is made, is produced here in this school? I don't know. This is for you to discuss. I'm sure that education produces private sort of product, something that could be sold in the market, as well as socially significant good. This gives just a set of possibilities. And then public good, which is just cannot be sold, divided, or I don't know, reserved and issued. But this certainly that influences the and determines the future of a country. I think that you follow like third line. What do you think, Liana? Do you agree? Well, dear colleagues, we have another 15 minutes. Okay, we'll give short answers. I got my point. Ken Irakli from Georgia, Price Waterhouse Group. It's a very interesting lecture. Thank you. Going back to doing business rating. Uh, well, you just put it that Georgian reform, it's all based upon, there is no realistic a uh, prerequisite for that. But in my view, economy of Kazakhstan, say, and of Georgia, they are fundamentally different, as well as their realities is different. If we go back to your graph, in your, you think that it will all go up, right? I mean, Georgian. Are there any mechanisms, for example, if the curve goes up? Can we just sort of work on this and make it go down? Thank you, Irakli. I suppose I'm the wrong person to be asked these questions. 
because I was an author for debureaucratization of Russia and positive integration of Kazakhstan. A precondition for developing it for Kazakhstan, it was not that it would be used in Kazakhstan, it was be, you could be used in other countries. And I'm sure that let's do it in Russia too. So I would put it this way. Certainly you can. As you go, uh, shift some conditions if you understand what dangers the economy will face. But I want to say that this March, uh, last March, I visited Tbilisi, visited Tbilisi, uh, Tbilisi University with Professor Biridze. Uh, we met in our free university in the School of Law with our colleagues and peers, the Georgian economists, and maybe directly, we directly spoke about such matters. How can we serve each other? And I uh, very, would very much want to have, be of help. For the start, for a start, we support visas for Georgian economists so that should travel to Moscow. And it's not a very simple matter in our bureaucracy. So the gist of this answer, yes, you can. I can even sort of get an idea, as it seems to me, how it works. But once I make these assumptions, I immediately remember that one of my friends He's a biologist. He works on. He says, "On our graves, it will." S uh, tombstone would say, uh, "They were mistaken, but they were honest in, in uh, their misunderstanding." Good day, Lev Gordon from Izhevsk. A very simple question. From our perspective, we look at activation, activation of SME and what we can see right now, based upon global experience and our own workings, it's very important to shift the focus of activity from federal to municipal level, because this is where people live. You can sort of reawaken the entrepreneurship initiative and under this strong state, which is not going to get any weaker. How can we find mechanisms and certain tools for all of us coming from all across the country to make the activity higher by 30 or to 50 percent and make the efficiency of the country some 10 to 15 percent higher? Thank you very much, Liev. It's a very good question because the problem of decentralization of uh, governance and government in Russia is one of the most central. I could quote Vice Premier Dmitry Korsak, who some 10 years ago, or oh, slightly less, at that time he was head of the office of the government, he says, we have a tax system that is not of a unitary state, but of a small unitary state. At that, we are a huge federation. For this reason, everybody is aware of that. There are special groups who work on this. I would put it this way. Economists all are for expanding the rights of the regions. Why the regions? Because in order to to um, enlarge their rights, you should have teams available at, at hand who can do it. At the level of regions so far, in some regions you may set up. It's quite a good comprehensive process. But it's hard to do it at the municipal level. But the federal government reached the opposite level that it's letting go the municipal level, but it won't let go of the regional levels. Well, come on. This come on is just cannot be done for one simple reason. At the municipal level, they do not have the budget. They do not have the money to do it. For this reason, for this reason, we suggest all kinds of experiments with voting tax systems so that people could give you the money. I can give you an example. In the Russian legislation, this is what um, country settlements, they can do what they call self-taxation. Nikita Bilich uh, ran an experiment in Kirov region where he's a governor where there's self-taxation. Then three mayors uh, then resigned because people would say, where did, you, where did you take away this 200 rubles that are paid? Where is the road or whatever? I want this to work because they make more active I suppose the key here is probable possible in selective taxation. 
and possibility to follow directly every ruble you pay. All strong democracy rules from good taxation, because from understanding that if you want to enjoy the right, you have to pay for it. There is no such thing as a free right. This is just a fake. Dear colleague, Shritova, please, you now have the floor. Shritova Alexandra from Skovsi region. Alexandra Sandrovich, you started in theory, you ended in practice. I'll begin with the theory and end in, in a question. Uh, Douglas Nord and John Nye worked in the paradigm of institutionalism, and they were saying that an institute is formal and informal rules of the game, the formula its constitution. So you are my colleague. Hello. And informal practices is like Mowgli. We uh, belong to the same blood. I got your message. Well, so nowadays we live in a democratic regime, and many state institutions are being replaced by non-state. It means by non-for-profits. But at this time, many people acknowledge that there is this kind of organizations like Gongo and Bongo. I don't know how to translate it, but organizations that are set up by the state um, as non-for-profits, but they work in the paradigm of the state. Do you think these organizations are an optimization and debureaucratization for our state or not? I will answer to you from the from my theoretical premises, okay? Since you now switch to this language. In the early 20th century, they discovered this, uh, Arnold Pigou discovered the uh, plummet in the market. They thought that this is the state that can treat it. Then the state did so many things to do. Then they came up with, like, this is the failures of the state. Gordon Tao came up with this notion that the failures of the state bureaucracy. In the next 15 years, it was that civil society is supposed to uh, close these gaps, which are called gaps by the society. Judge, based upon this sad conclusions by cause, uh, since it is a uh, variety is possible that in civil society can also can have gaps. Congo and Bongo, it's nothing rather than gaps of the civil society. For this reason, there is no such thing as a one-size-fits-all approach. Uh, you should get used to it. And all phenomena have to be looked at from the perspective of what transactional costs will be generated, what possible options are, not just dishonored opportunistic behavior and what are the things that people would do so I would say that gonga and bonga if we if we look at it carefully we will see very much the same factors that could be analyzed in the same manner the people did it because they were the in limited institution and this is where they wanted to make money without uh, investing anything there. That is why we should be quite plain about saying there are gaps um, made by the, and failures made both by the, like very much like what the society, like the state, and uh, others can do. What do we do then? Carry on living, that's what I suggest. Okay. Nikita Volchkov from Moscow, two question, if you will. My first question is, Nikita, please one. We only have six more minutes. Please give some time for your comments. Leave some room. Then I'll let this cause the theorem. Are you not alarmed by too much, uh, sort of too great economism of this? Because figures can be all right, economies are down, but um, culture, social spheres seem to be disregarded by this. Yes. Well, well, I have to say quite the opposite. What is this, the discovery about transaction costs based upon? Uh, that understanding that people can behave um, opportunistically, these are factors of culture, not of economy. Actually, uh, institution economic theory, this is what thinks that culture matters more than economy. But I do, and I do. In, I work in, in form, on informal institutions, and this is what I will deliver a lecture in on uh, Brassens Theatre on the 22nd of June. One is delivered by Sergei Binipalopov, he spoke about psychology of the evil, and then I deliver a lecture of the culture code of economic, economics, of economy. This comes very close, right? 
We come from um, Moscow State University. He has a department in uh, in School of Psychology, and I'm a dean of the School of Economics. So, certainly, culture matters more than economy, and it was obvious to Coase. Absolutely, that's why he saw that absolutely undebatable thing, such as the social friction that was disregarded by economists for 200 years. Okay, third row, please. Whoever is keen to uh, say two hands, uh, please. Lady, please. Anna Zakarian from Volgograd. You know, we have a surprising situation in this country with people who just served time. As they leave jails, former inmates cannot survive as they get into free life. They cannot find their job, and gradually they become castaways and I, rogues. And I know these people who the best who go back to jail for a comfortable lives. The question is why, in our seemingly great, beautiful, big country, we don't do any rehab work for this. If we say that even, you know, keeping these jails, it's quite an expensive matter. What is the rationale about it? Thank you. Actually, may I remind you that we in the United States of America are great penitentiary powers. Both us and the Americans, we keep too m very many people in jail. Europe has f many fewer uh, <laughs> by far fewer inmates. At that, we do not really know what the real penitentiary system is. We don't quite understand its economy because, well, we certainly know how that sort of le legislation of it works. It's easy to look it up. But in real life, it's rarely do you see that, say, uh, that things, that life corresponds fully to what the law describes. Life is always more sophisticated and sometimes gives us a drastically different picture from what the law portrays. My answer to the question, why don't we have these costs and uh, anything to do with rehab? Because we, first of all, um, do not fully understand the very penitentiary system and its econ economy. Look, this study is almost non-existent. I should point out that two years ago we began to draft this closed seminar about penitentiary why we be behind the closed doors because we had to get the attendance by the federal service of the penitentiary to have an honest talk how it really works but unfortunately uh, there are other reasons and uh, some events happened which just cancelled this event on a regular basis and otherwise I fully agree with you that this is really a major problem but I don't know what answer to give to your question because if I want to give an answer to a question, I suppose we need to first research this issue. And we haven't done it as yet. Kaliningrad right now, please. Thank you. Ivan Vlasov, uh, um, Moscow State University graduate. This morning we had a talk by your colleague, Sergei Vladimirovich Alexandrenko. Uh, and uh, as to the question, what priority tasks could help the Russian economy, says independent court, political competition, and honest election. Do you agree with your colleague, and if you do, why? I agree in part. We discussed it with Sergei many times. You see, I have researched greatly successful economic modernizations. At an early stage of a modernization, it's very important to have an independent court. But it's not necessary to have the parliament. At later stages, you can't do without parliament because the success of South Korea, Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, well, to a great extent, we, Georgi Satarov and we made our calculations. He made the calculations and commented for a joint article in the questions um, Vapros Economiki, a most recent institutional transformation where we looked at world examples, how you can really have successful economic transformation and get good uh, dynamics without yet having, for example, political competition. There is just uh, replacing. But indeed, court's judicial system is very important. But you see, society can live 
for a while without legislative power, without executive, without ju but without judiciary power it cannot live. You think that it lives without it. It means that somebody else, maybe with a crime, maybe whoever is doing it. You should see first how it works in life and then try to to turn this into a legal system. I really do think that this is very important. I'm sorry. If to be quite quite just like things that finalize it, my dis difference with Sergei Vladimirovich is about this. Uh, this our sliding into a track when we see things repeat happens for the reason because the poets saw it for a while and the economists only saw it in 1990. This is what they called path-dependent program. Vladimir Karnilov, Russian poet, Soviet poet, he wrote our history. It was thought that it was all about political regime. Okay, we changed it, but we became three times as poor and became poorer and we would change, uh, we would just be deceived. Instead, we should have changed ourselves so much. I think we should start with culture. Dear colleagues, Alexander Alexandrovich uh, makes us a present by spoiling us by attending every, coming here every year, and we appreciate it highly. Unfortunately, my job is that I could certainly get up and you could continue for another hour if the expert would agree, but regrettably we have our timetable, there is Kirill Logov will talk and I do understand that one expert cannot replace another. And yet, let us thank our speaker once again. Thank you, thank you. And I'm sorry for keeping you waiting and um, postponing your dinner. Okay, dinner, we resume our work in an hour. Meeting adjourns.